many of us ever know what it is to become the perfect version of ourselves? This is Decoding Superhuman with your host, Boomer Anderson. All right, Satsu, let's have some fun today. Whoops, I think I'm blowing the volume up. (laughs) You are, I can hear it. (laughs) (laughs) So today we're going to talk a little bit about... uh, (laughs) When Right Goes Wrong is going to be the title of this episode, but I'm fascinated by nutrition and nutritional history. And so, Satu, what is the worst nutritional advice you've ever received? Well, I received back in the days, maybe 10 years back, uh, an advice that I should focus on eating light dairy products, including like light yogurt, light cheese, everything that has the word light. Okay. Can I just ask a question before we yeah. move on here? Are you dairy sensitive? Yes, I actually am. Yeah. I didn't yeah. understand that back then. Uh, yeah. Well, neither one of them helped. So at the end, I just skipped the dairy. Um, that's that's the end of that story. And I'm feeling much better now. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. How is it for you? What is, what is your ba- worst advice that you've received? So this is kind of funny. I'm going to take people back now because uh, back in the day, and we're going way back, early 90s, I want to say, in the NBA, it was the rookie year of Grant Hill, who had just come out of Duke University basketball, and he was in the NBA playing for whomever he was playing for at that point. And there was this Sprite commercial, and you know Sprite, right, Mm Sauter? Yeah, yeah. So Sprite and uh, Sprite is a carbonated beverage, and I'm only saying that because in certain places in the world it may not be called Sprite, but Sprite is like Seven Up, and it's one of these lemon lime things, citrusy sodas, Mm. and it was advertising quench your thirst, and. I found that very interesting because at that time I probably was consuming a lot of Sprite and Mm -hmm. this is no one's out, no one else's fault, but my own, but you know, Grant Hill was one of my favorite players. I grew up watching Duke university basketball and kind of naturally followed his advice. Turns out that Sprite may not be the best way to quench your thirst. Really? (laughs) (laughs) Not only that, it's a great way to get diabetes, but, um, Before we move on with the show, I have to give a disclaimer because today we're going to be talking about food. We're going to be talking about good habits, bad habits, and mainly bad habits. But just show everyone's crystal clear here listening. Satsu and I are just sharing information. This is by no means nutritional or medical advice. We're just talking a little bit about history of food and sort of right and wrong advice that we've received. Should you need nutritional or medical advice, please go see your physician or your nutritionist. Uh, Virtuosity and or decoding superhuman will not be held liable in any way. Excellent. Now that I have that over, can we get started? Yes, please. Excellent. So let's talk about kind of an interesting dichotomy within generations. There is this... And you rightfully pointed this out before we were talking, um, before recording. Mm. There seems to be a, sort of a difference in perception between kind of age groups mm. of things like fat, but also artificial sweeteners. So with that, should we get started? Yes, let's do that. Should we do age before beauty here in terms of? Where yeah, I start? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So yeah, I was thinking, like, who? Which one of us is old? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, didn't, I was, I was trying to tie it back into the topic rather yeah. than the, yeah. So I guess that means I get to kick things off. So let's talk about <laughs> fat because uh, dietary fat is a fascinating concept, and we're almost going to the extreme opposite end in certain aspects of society right now with things like the ketogenic diet and the keto revolution. But let's take ourselves back, passport back to that time when Grant Hill was advertising Sprite. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot going on in the marketing of certain oils, but also the marketing of fat in general. And in particular, you touched on it on the things that you were experiencing growing up, right? Being told to eat low fat, uh, being told to avoid fat, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And there's still quite a number of people right now that 
believe that low fat may be the way to go. And, and let's be honest here, in certain cases, it can be the way to go. Yeah. Um, we can identify those ways through genetics. But right now, it's, it's very interesting to see the age discourses here, mm. that some of the older generation still holds on to the idea that low fat may be a better way to go with living. Yeah. But let's, I want, I want to share just kind of a story growing up. Um, growing up, I became very interested in fitness at a very young age. This was possibly due to an interest in women as well and trying to impress the opposite <laughs> sex. But at the age of 12, I had it in my mind that I wanted to be a bodybuilder. I was one of these, yeah, 12 years old. Right. And it's kind of Crazy. funny, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was one of these guys who my dad had a Bowflex in the basement. And I'm not sure if you know what the Bowflex is, but it's like these rod, plastic rods. And uh -huh. it, it's one of these things that you can buy on late night TV. And <laughs> basically, I, I would go down and use the Bowflex every day with this idea of building muscles. Um, with a sort of lifestyle of a bodybuilder, you generally start to read certain magazines, right? Or at least a 12 year old bodybuilder starts to read certain magazines. Mm. And, you know, every month I would get flex magazine, which is an interesting magazine itself. I would get muscle and fitness and I would get, um, what was the other one? Men's health and men's mm -hmm. health basically became my Bible from the age of 12 to 18. And every month, Men's Health would come up with these recommendations of workouts and different articles and things. And I swear I will tie this back into fat. And I basically followed whatever Men's Health told me to do. And that's that's fine. I think a lot of people kind of do fall into that category of following what mass media tells them mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. Quite natural. And I recall quite, and this has happened a couple of times in my life, where one time they said, there was this big, I wouldn't say it's an advertisement, but it was an article about how canola oil was really good for joints. And growing up, I was an ice hockey player. I was a lacrosse player. I was a multi-sport varsity athlete. Like this, like that was, athletics were my thing. Mm -hmm. And I took this to heart, maybe a little too literally here, <laughs> and started adding canola oil to everything. And canola oil uh, became sort of a staple in my diet to the point where I cooked with it. I, you know, threw it in everything I could and with this idea of bettering my joints. Wow. What does that sound? Does that sound like a good idea to you, Satu? Horrible. Horrible. <laughs> I take it in Finland, they didn't actually, did you guys ever cook with canola oil? Not in my family, but I think my family... <laughs> chose quite early on the go for the olive oil i just remember yeah. growing up with olive oil so it wasn't just canola oil though like we we i used quite a lot of vegetable oils growing up as most american families sometimes do mm. and these can be anything from soybean oil to sunflower oil etc yeah and the reason why i gave the prelude to the story is that i now categorically know what i was doing was wrong and there's many many reasons why it was wrong. And so let's let's start down sort of that path of why vegetable oil may not be the way to go. Do you want to throw one up there in terms of one of your favorite reasons why you don't use vegetable oil? All right. So you guys are probably wondering, what are the brands of blue light blockers that I recommend? Well, one of them is the sponsor for today's podcast. And they are blue blocks. I've had the CEO, Andy Mant, on the show before where we got into a really deep dive on blue light. And you know that if you get any amount of blue light in your glasses, no matter if it's 3%, 10%, whatever, it does disrupt melatonin production. And so Andy has created blue light blockers that hold up to the highest standards. And in fact, and I'll link to it in the show notes, you can see when he's tested it versus other brands that they always come out on top. And so quality is a thing I appreciate and is what exactly I recommend for all of our clients. But if you head over to blueblocks.com, that's B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and plug in the code DS15, you're going to get 15% off. And now on with the show. Well, I think 
the obvious reason is just for me that I would not feel good about it. I my body doesn't like it. Um, I get inflammation in my body, um, mm-hmm. and it doesn't really support my brain either. So I think there are quite crucial reasons already, uh, without even going deeper into the effects. And I think those are those are indeed crucial reasons. But let's talk a little bit about sort of the the effects of it. So when you cook with uh, canola oil, and a lot of people like to cook with canola oil because it theoretically does well at high heat. Mm. Um, but what happens is you actually can oxidize fat when you're cooking with it. And when you oxidize that fat, there's a lot that can happen to disturb your body. And in fact, what's interesting is, and I, I love um, the book Deep Nutrition when it comes to the subject, mm-hmm. but when I was consuming all of these canola oil products and whatever it is, um, I was, I was exposing myself to things like inflammation, of course, Mm. but also, you know, when you oxidize a fat and it goes into your body, particularly canola oil, it turns into, in some cases, a trans fat. Now, this is interesting because if you told people that canola oil morphs into a trans fat, or if Mm. you told people that canola oil is in effect a surrogate to a trans fat, what do you think they would say? Yeah. Then first they wouldn't believe it. And then they would be like, oh no. (laughs) Yeah. So the government has nutritional labels for how much trans fat is in something, but for some reason this doesn't apply to canola oil. Mm. And so, you know, one of, uh, one of the things that I like to look at is sort of the reasons or actually, you know, what happens if you're intaking canola oil and they have knock on effects with canola oil from everything to your gut, you can easily give yourself leaky gut with it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, of course, knock-on effects to things like cholesterol, um, your arteries, etc. And where I want to go next with that is just sort of what, how to avoid canola oil or vegetable oil in general. And I'll, I'll be brief on this because I also want to touch on why fats can be a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's very common in restaurants now. And there was this great, interesting article about how some really famous restaurants in Napa Valley were using a blend of olive oil and vegetable oil and trying to get away with it. But when you go into a restaurant now, uh, I always ask, this is a personal thing for me. I always ask to either have them cook it with butter or olive oil. Yeah, And the reason is, is because I do not want to expose my brain, which I find to be absolutely precious to toxic things like canola oil, like vegetable oil in general. Yeah. Um, also check out your salad dressings. There's a couple of good companies out there like Primal Kitchen, shout out to Mark Sisson on that one, that have been able to recreate really good salad dressings uh, without the vegetable oils. But your salad dressings, generally speaking, unless you're using olive oil and vinegar, read the label because there are things like you know canola oil, vegetable oil, et cetera, hidden within those that you just want to absolutely avoid. Yeah, I think the same goes, at least here in in the Nordics, for a couple of ingredients or things that we often buy. Um, Mayonnaise is one of the problems. Um, So we do it ourselves at home from olive oil. Um, And then the other one is when you want to buy like um, sardines or mackerels, those small fishes in cans, you have to pay, unfortunately, triple the amount of money to get it in olive oil because yeah. all the normal products are with uh, vegetable oils. Yeah. And another thing that we should touch on before moving on to why fats may be a good thing is uh, omega-6-3 ratio. Mm. And while canola oils is relatively low, if you look at the omega-6-3 ratios of things like sunflower oil, uh, things like grapeseed oil, etc., they're going to be in the double digits, if not hundreds uh, in terms of six to three ratio. Now, Mm. why is that important? Because if you're looking to optimize for both longevity, performance, and really just overall awesomeness, (laughs) keeping an omega-6-3 ratio of four to one below is ideal. And so what you're doing there is you're creating an environment that is low inflammation within your body or lower chances of inflammation within your body. Yeah. And that 
is a recipe for success. So key message on the bad fats, avoid them. Let's talk about one of the reasons why you may want to embrace fat. And that starts with the steroid hormone pathway. And one of the key ingredients to optimizing your hormones is dietary fat. So we just spent a good 10 minutes here talking a little bit about why fat is bad or sorry, bad fats are bad. Mm, exactly. One of the, you know, there's things that need to be acknowledged here is that fat is not all bad and it'll help prime your hormone pathway. So if you want to optimize your hormones, dietary fat is absolutely essential. If you're looking to achieve ketosis, it's debatable whether or not you need dietary fat or if it's just an absence of glucose. I believe a combination of both is is helpful. Mm. But also there's this kind of misnomer about cholesterol. And I don't want to spend too much time here because I don't want to wake the demon, so to speak. But cholesterol is very important for your body. It's not all negative. And so your brain runs a lot on dietary fat and cholesterol. And so if you're looking to optimize how your body functions, rather than thinking that all fat is bad, look at good fat versus bad fat. And maybe that's the title of a book we should write someday. Yeah. But um uh, in that bad fat category, I would probably throw, you know, things like that canola oil, vegetable oil, et cetera. But the good fats, think about ancestral wisdom here in terms of what your ancestors cooked with. You know, I have ancestors all over Europe, but the majority of, so let's say Polish, well, maybe I'll get this, Poland, sort of Central Europe ancestors hmm, may have cooked with tallow. And so looking at Things like beef tallow as potential mm. cooking um, cooking agents, but also butter, ghee. Uh, I prefer ghee just because I am dairy sensitive, yeah, highly dairy sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, and I love cooking with olive oil, yeah. but I'll keep that to a low heat as well. Yeah. The key message there, guys, good fats are good, bad fats are bad, but embrace the good fat. Yeah. Satu, there's something interesting happening right now with that that younger generation, right? And I, I wouldn't know if I qualify as younger anymore. But yeah. I think you should do. we touch on that? Yeah, yeah. We should. We should. Um I think the younger generation, uh, now that we've spoken about fats, I don't think they are not so afraid of using fats and they're more aware of the benefits and everything. Um, but what I do seem to feel like is more of a concern is sugar and in terms of sugars, artificial sweeteners. Um, we've moved from sugar, sugar is bad to let's solve this issue that we can still have a lot of sugar and sweet stuff just by using other type of things. And what are these things? Well, you can have everything from aspartame to uh, all sorts of even. Well, I know that most of the people say stevia is a good thing, but I think even that, if you would use it too much, might cause issues for some. I would not say that using refined sugar is good either. Um, yeah, I would people just should just avoid all that, right? of that out. But I think the biggest concern that I've seen now also with athletes is that they tend to drink these sports drinks that are also light, uh, which means there is no sugar and they actually advertise it that way, but it's filled with artificial sweeteners. And when you start reading the label, you're like, why should I drink this? Yeah, What's can I I can't me? even pronounce it. Right? Yeah. And the only thing you might understand is like BCAA. Okay, wow, there's a small amount of that. Well, that you can find somewhere else as well. You don't need to drink that Red Bull. Okay, now I'm going into <laughs> which labels, but there is one brand here in the Nordics especially that is really popular. I'm not going to put the name out now but everyone mm -hmm. knows what i'm talking about and i think everyone should avoid it in my personal opinion and why well i think there are multiple reasons why to avoid in general artificial sweeteners and i've also experienced that myself my stomach and my gut health is so important for me that i would never sacrifice it with putting mm -hmm. something like that in my stomach that can also lead to as you already mentioned earlier to leaky gut for example 
um, that could lead to, if we're not talking about stomach issues, that could also lead to mental issues, anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um, you, overusing artificial sweeteners also leads to headaches, migraines, and those can be things that you don't understand where they're coming from. And then once you, someone tells you, stop drinking that X sports drink, and then you realize, oh, it was that interesting, but that can keep you in this, this slow, low inflammation that harms you. And especially if you would get injured as an athlete, what happens then if you have a chronic inflammation in your body? If you're a business executive, well, if you're tired and need to drink something, I would rather drink the coffee than the Red Bull. Um, but I think the effect with that, if it's Red Bull or anything else like that, it, for your brain, it's not going to do any good. That was a lot of uh, me talking. What, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Boomer. <laughs> no, I'm um look, a, a general good old sage advice and I don't know who I got this from is like if you can't pronounce it or if it's not uh if it's not something that swims is on land or is a natural ingredient, you know, you probably want to avoid it. And this is where I'm going to get myself in trouble because people will tell me like taurine is a natural ingredient and that's mm. absolutely correct. But like if you can't pronounce it, um you know, you may get yourself in trouble and artificial sweeteners, those kind of things. It, what I like to do is just simplify my life. You have enough going on, right? Like we mm. have enough going on. We've got a business to run. We've got things going on every day. You know, I'm planning a wedding and, and just simplify. Yeah. And if you can simplify your life to, you know, coffee, water, and, and you know, avoiding our artificial sweeteners in general, why not? It just yeah. leaves your brain to make a lot better decisions. Exactly. In other areas. And, and read the labels. If you're, whether it's a drink or a snack, uh, like a protein bar that you really think should be healthy, most of the times, unfortunately, it's not because they also contain everything from, well, sugar to high fructose corn syrup to artificial sweeteners uh, mm -hmm. and the wrong type of wheat, dairy, whatever. So depending on what, what suits your uh, nutrition, I think read the labels first. Um, and you can get a lot of energy from other natural stuff than, uh, than these kind of ready-made bars or drinks. Absolutely. Yeah. Satu, anything else we want to add to this conversation? Well, I could go on and on talking about this, but I think you know, we've covered the basics. Excellent. So key messages here, avoid artificial sweeteners if you can. Um, and, you know, be wise about your fats. Yes. To all the superhumans listening out there, have an absolutely epic day. Superhumans, before you go, if you enjoy the episode, if you enjoy all of our episodes, head on over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating. It would really, really help get the word out on what we're doing here at Decoding Superhuman. Feedback. If you want to give us direct feedback or you want to see us cover a specific topic, whether on the shorter episodes or the longer episodes, head on over to your email and email us at podcast at decodingsuperhuman.com. For those of you who have sent emails to that address, you know that I respond to every single one. And then lastly, would you like 300 to 500 words of highly curated information on how to upgrade performance? If so, head on over to decodingsuperhuman.com slash throwdown and you'll get our next issue of the throwdown, which is our 300 to 500 word highly curated digest, if you will, on what's going on in the field of performance. Enjoy your day, superhumans, and thank you from the bottom of my heart for tuning in to today's episode.